second. And, oh, and we're live. Hello, everybody. Happy. Hello. <laughs> uh, happy Friday, Lisa. Happy Friday, Josh. <laughs> it is. It has been a, a kind of a wild and woolly week, and of course, uh, our hearts go out to everybody who's being again impacted by yet another national crisis. And uh, wow. I know. I, I don't know. We, we've been having to. We've been going live on a lot of these days lately. It seems like something's happening, but yeah, it's we just we just pray for everybody. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know the 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 subject of the Civil War is especially for the the history of Missouri is timely in this regard. Because it, it is hard to fully express the the level of not only of discontent but also of uh, of rage that that took place in our immediate history in the 1850s and 1860s, and then of course the the you know Missouri and of course Arkansas uh, having to recover from that uh, in in and attempt to rise from the ashes and in and it is also a cautionary tale because in some cases they didn't there are many um uh, towns in the missouri ozarks we'll just deal with missouri ozarks for a moment that never were never rebuilt oh yeah th there's there's 12 in my county alone and let's uh let's let's jump into that the the order uh you know it uh, well first of all and this is just sort of my thoughts on on the outside and feel free to to weigh in on this but the fact that missouri was a pivotal state it uh it was it was a state that that president lincoln understood that in order to ensure a union victory that missouri could not be lost and and originally in terms of arguments of states rights um, Missouri, the, the, the state um, legislature of Missouri voted to remain neutral and said, we're just not going to participate, which, you know, sounds noble, really. And in some ways, yes. <laughs> and, and say, you know, the, the idea that we're just not participating um, and, you know, that we're, we're, we, we're not against the union we're not necessarily pro confederate we're not necessarily pro slavery we just don't want a war in our state right and and i think there's a probably majority that really wanted wanted to stay in the union but mm -hmm. um uh and and a good portion that were like well if they want to go let them go uh, mm -hmm. to the, to the secessionist states, um, but then it, part of the problem then it, it changed. Well, a couple of things. One, the federal government couldn't really do that because there was federal arsenal, multiple federal arsenals, and strategic um, points. They didn't want to lose control of uh, the Mississippi, um, which controlling the Mississippi led to Vicksburg and everything else. Anyway. But then, um, just as Lincoln was elected at the end of 1860, we got a new governor, Claiborne Jackson, who mm -hmm. ostensibly spoke in terms more like the previous governor of neutrality, but very quickly um, changed his tune. And within, um, well, let's see within five months of taking off, well, less than that, because they took office in March, then within three months, he was marching an army south to join up with the Confederates and uh, ultimately held a, a state convention in exile to secede. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and with the, with the, uh, the Union, and, and I think it's, because the Civil War was so, the, the battle lines were so blurred in Missouri, I, I think that uh, you know, individuals who may just have a cursory knowledge of the Civil War 
may, for example, not realize that there was a lot going on in in the state. That's true. That's and, true. And, and Missouri was a, a, a battleground center for the Western theater. And, and I also feel like, and this is just my, you know, innate UFO conspiracy theories coming to the, the surface. <laughs> uh, but we know that the, the in, in all cases, and this is, I mean, I grew up, I grew up in Abraham Lincoln country in, in Illinois. Um, so this is not an, an anti-union statement, but we know that the union, the winners write the history books. They, they always have, they always will in, in, you know, or at least in terms of, of managing and controlling the narrative. I feel, important disclaimer, I feel, not I know, but I feel that there were many decisions that, were, that either were made or had to be made in, in the Missouri battleground that were not pretty. Um, no. They were they were not gallant. They were not the kind of thing that you want to go home and tell your children about what you had to do. And it was easier uh, to focus on some of the more uh, um, easily explained, some of the more uh, Napoleonic charge uh, types of encounters. And, and that tended to dominate much of the historic narrative in the generation following the Civil War. And as such, that the, the, the Civil War in the Ozarks, uh, or the Ozarks region, had a tendency to get swept under the rug. And something that, that assisted in that was the, the fact that there were so many skirmishes and the, the casualty counts for individual battles tended to be comparatively low. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a, as a result, you could say, oh, look, that wasn't that big of a battle. Not a big deal. Nothing to see here. Let's talk about Manassas. Those types of things. I'm you know, resorting right. a little to hyperbole, but it, it that sense of let's not look at some of the things that we did. And of course, one of those things was uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, total creating a sense of total war mm -hmm. against a civilian population that, you know, in, in we've, we've learned some of these lessons, you know, before, much like the, the U.S. Uh, waging a, a total war against the civilian population, which guerrillas were entrenched within in Vietnam, uh, we were, you know, the Union was seeing something similar with Confederate guerrillas entrenched within a, a mixed bag of, of, of uh, citizens and civilians. And uh, your uh, area of the Ozarks, those counties were uh, directly impacted by those decisions. Oh, definitely. It was known as the Burnt District. Um, it was sort of a um, a little small, smaller in the sense of the area-wise and everything. But the same policies carried out that really Sherman uh, ultimately had to do on his march to the sea to to uh, uh, complete the the uh, interruption of uh, industrial. Uh, Georgia and so forth, and when they mm -hmm. were in towns, etc., that that had been going on in Western Missouri since the beginning of the war. Yes, and so, and part of that is one reason we know a lot more about that out there is, and and part of the when obviously the Union did write the narrative. However, they they kind of lost the narrative battle in the end with the lost cause narrative, um, and. The South kind of, they actually did kind of win the narrative and, and try to rewrite it that it was all about states' rights and honor, et cetera, and, and try to ignore slavery as a factor. Um, and so in so doing, then, when you talk about Sherman and you talk about the wilderness uh, campaign, then, you know, you're painting the Union as these butchers and... Uh, but both sides did it. Yes, we'll be candid, and it and it and it really happened here throughout the war. Yes. Yeah, and it and and I think especially in 
you know, in, in moments of our current contemporary history where we see such um, increasing polarization, division, and violence uh, between opposing viewpoints, we have experienced this in the past, and it is so easy to want to to paint uh, this in, you know, in in very very specific ways, and and to, you know, to come in and and just say. Oh, this side's right, this side's wrong. We have grown up, um, certainly, you know, with, from from Lone Ranger to Star Wars, at least, you know, the first movie and a half, uh, these, you know, that good guys wear white hats, bad guys wear, you know, ride black horses, and it's very simple, and we we have good guys and bad guys, and that, that basic sense of, of polarization, and digging into the uncomfortable history of the Civil War in the Ozarks shows that it is, first of all, you know, it is a cliche, but history is messy. Uh, but second of all, that you can have heroes who are also villains, mm -hmm. uh, villains who are also heroes. You, you know, and then um, I'm, Jumping, I'm going to jump to a little bit of the the aftermath of the Civil War, which was, of course, the the bald knobber vigilantes, and then jump to the the uh, oh the 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 inspirational, you know, the the second group of bald knobbers, which were largely inspired by the first. Uh, you could say it was a copycat vigilante group. Um, in in Christian County, those were the folks who wore the masks, and you know they were they were you know, three, um, uh, three bald knobbers, father, son, and additional um, adult man were, were ultimately sentenced to hang. And the, the Eden massacre, which they directly participated in was a massacre. It was, it was a very, it was terrible. Um, and yet these men were also family men who were honorable and uh, according to their own code and believed that they were doing right in the moment that they had before them it's it's tough it is well and in and and that example is a li even a better illustration because the older walker he tried to stop the massacre but yet he ended up being hanged and he and one of the others that that was convicted escaped and he had an opportunity to escape and he didn't because he thought ultimately in his idea justice would prevail yes yes he did yeah yeah so. yeah dave walker and you know i've i've stood in the mouth of the cave of uh, the bald number cave in christian county where dave walker stood and addressed his men and the idea that one of his men was his own teenage son who would, you know, ultimately be hanged alongside him. It mm -hmm. is, and I, and I think that it, it is, it is not, it, it is not wrong to understand the nuance of, and the complexity and the emotional complexity of that when you, you know, it, there, there's been a couple of points that I've been nearly brought to tears thinking about the, you know, the, the quality of that. And that does not mean that I was, you know, am somehow looking back over history and saying that the Eden massacre was justified because right. it wasn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, these people that we're talking about are humans beings just like us with with hopes and dreams and aspirations and also the capacity to make great and terrible mistakes very very true very very true and i think hopefully at the end of the day those nuances of what's going on today are recognized i i i sincerely hope so and then you know and 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 of course, within the, the larger narrative, 
you know, there, there's, there's going to be reckoning on a variety of sides um, for that. And, and being, being willing to understand that nuance does not say, oh, I'm on this side or I'm on that side. It's, it's not that at all. But realizing at the, at the end of the day, as much as it's difficult to admit sometimes, first of all, we're all just human and deeply, deeply imperfect. And second of all, that <clears throat> it's, it, it is at every one of these juncture points, it is a cautionary tale. And because we think, oh, if I was in that situation, I would deal with it just fine. And here's how it would be. And, and we wouldn't, you know, it would, it is, it is impossible and, and deeply arrogant and, and a, a moment of, of sheer uh, hubris to, to say, oh, I would take care of that without a problem. There would not be any issues. No, we would screw it up as well. Well, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, um, Fortunately, at times we learn from mistakes. Unfortunately, at times we don't. But uh, that being said, how about we talk about some some fun things? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> some some fun dark things. <laughs> I guess first of all, we should make an announcement. Yes, yes. Yes. Go you you take it, and I will fill in from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, June 27th, Josh and I will be hosting Mysterious Horse State at the Coleman Theater in Miami, Oklahoma. Yes. And we are going to be focusing on subjects from the Dark Ozarks. So mm -hmm. you can come out, you can uh, meet us in person. We, you know, and we will be doing a lot of uh, Q&A and just really getting into different topics. And anyone that is concerned about social distancing, that's not a problem in the Coleman Theater. It is no. it's cavernous, and they are making provisions for all of that. So um, we will have fun, and we are going to end it talking about Billy Cook and watching The Hitchhiker inspired by uh, his killing spree. Yes, I and I've never seen the movie. Oh, you, my, you haven't. <laughs> I know, that's my... Uh, um what's the word for it? that's my my confession of the evening i have not seen the film uh looking forward to seeing the film i am very excited about this we had actually had something similar to this event on the on the books in march and was not able to do it and the coleman theater for people who have not um been to the coleman theater just the opportunity to walk into the structure is worth is just worth it is worth your effort um one of the most beautiful uh theaters to walk into and um and of course miami is a is a neat uh oklahoma town with uh with incredible history. yes and 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 really in that what is and I, I, we're we're gonna jump around on this and i think it's important um there's always a lot of question about where the ozarks are uh or are not and the the ozarks are a vast mountain plateau that uh, are predominantly in southern missouri and northwest arkansas but they include a, a beautiful chunk of oklahoma a corner, <laughs> admittedly small corner, but a corner of Kansas and even a little slice of the state of Illinois um, mm -hmm. in, in that, that whole. And so you have, and of course the, the Ozarks are broken into regions, uh, the, the Springfield Plateau, the Salem Plateau, the St. Francois Mountains, which are volcanic of origin uh, over around Farmington with a lot of lead mining. And then, uh, uh, the Boston Mountains, which are incredibly beautiful in Arkansas, just south of, of me here in, in the Branson area. The Branson area is known as the White River Country, or the Shepherd of the Hills Country, or the Land of a Million Smiles, if you take the 1930s <laughs> uh, tourism booster club marketing material. But um, 
<laughs> the and then and then you have the the um, uh, the the borders, uh, the borderlands, and we're going to be dealing a bit with those borderlands and something that I love about Miami. I mean, it is you are just into the Oklahoma flatlands. Yes. Like just, <laughs> and I I consider those places to to function, you know, to exist as as um, sort of you know conceptual gateways uh, to to the Ozarks. There's there's a number of of locations that I would consider that, and so being at the in in Miami to me is really cool it is of course you know you're you you have the incredible and and sometimes very tragic history of the the u.s government forcibly moving uh, native american nations first nation peoples into oklahoma which was originally called indian territory literally uh before it became a state and a lot of a lot of history and a lot of bloodshed and uh, and a lot of money um, mm -hmm. because of the the discovery of oil at the you know in the early part of the 20th century and mining and, yes uh, which of course stretches directly into the the Joplin we, when we say tri-state mining district the three the tri-states that we're talking about is Missouri Oklahoma and Kansas yeah and all of that just kind of to me just sort of uh intensifies with the the singular history of the Coleman Theater, mm -hmm. it re it really does. It's really a, a good example. I mean, for for anyone who uh, is wondering, um, you you approach it and you you think, oh, we, it's Spanish Baroque. It's beautiful, and then you walk in and the interior is based on Versailles, um, literally. <laughs> yeah, it's. It's so it's an exquisite, exquisite building and the the restoration efforts uh, by the, the group of individuals, you know, and the, the organization in charge of it have just done a, a breathtaking oh, it's job. It's, they, uh, they really have. They they did not they did not um, do it halfway. No, when they, no. When they rebuild it. So it's always a, just an incredible honor to be able to sit on the stage. I think you and I have done been in in discussions similar to these uh events similar to these what three times i think so yeah a lot it's of fun. A, it's always fun people get involved so uh if you're interested uh tickets will be on sale this week uh, this coming week on the uh, coleman theater website tickets are ten dollars and it's from noon until 8 p.m so you know um yeah. can't beat that and I Proceeds help the theater too. Absolutely, and I think that's that's a, that by itself is a worthy cause. And uh, just being able, I, I think, and one of the things that uh, a lot of a lot of what we do on stage is, is very similar to what we do here. Um, just being able to to visit and about these topics uh and and get feedback uh that's very interactive folks it's it's not uh um, sure it's not stuff sure no it it is not and it's and it's not there's there's very little uh conceptual barrier between audience and and uh the stage we invite people to to ask questions to you know it's mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of open dialogue and 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 we we keep and we keep learning things every time we go too. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do. We do. And and along with that, you know, and and this is this is something that that is as we move forward with uh, oh, with Dark Ozarks, we've talked about the fact that we we want you know that the, the dark ozarks is a story of the ozarks told by ozarkers by individuals who who understand and respect the ozarks that that this isn't a, an outside team uh coming in and filming you know circus sideshow hillbillies put those in quotes that that there's an enormous amount to be learned um and in in that regard uh, just, I mean, even just coming back to 
our exper- experience at the at the Ritchie Mansion. Mm-hmm. Uh, we oh, had yeah. just got there. We were getting ready to visit, um, and all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door, and uh, individuals uh, from Oklahoma, I believe. I think I believe uh, so. Uh, uh, older gentleman was was wanting to uh, to tour, and and to me, such an incredible uh, moment. It would, I, I think the the temptation, and I I just like visiting people, and I know you do too. So I don't think that this was a temptation for us, but a, like a larger societal temptation to say, oh, we're the experts, and you're you know who are you? Right. And, and, you know, five minutes into the conversation in the tour, he is sharing uh, experiences and historical information that we're so excited to, to get to to hear. Yes. And, and, and that's a good example. And that's what happens there. So anyone who is interested, uh, you know, if you have questions, let us know. But we'd love to see you June 27th. Yeah. And then, um, oh, talk about sensitivity as we were earlier. Um, we, we've been asked a number of times to to talk about the missing three from Springfield. Yeah. And, and I think that's very important to address. I think so too. Um, and we'd meant to get to it last week at, and we ran out of time, but um, anyone who's not familiar with the, the missing three, um, so missing three women, uh, we're talking about um, Cheryl Streeter, Susie Streeter, and Stacy McCall, and uh, they disappeared uh, June 7th of 1992, uh, just after high school graduation. Stacy had gone over to her best friend Susie's house. The next morning, she was supposed to be home and wasn't. Actually, uh, some friends of theirs um, had gone over to the house early the next morning because they they all were going to go somewhere, do something, and no one was there, but they noticed a, um, the porch light bulb was was broken, and they they cleaned up the uh, the glass guide out in front of the door, and but they just thought they had just left, and they didn't think much about it. Uh, a couple of hours go by and Stacy's mother hasn't been able to get a hold of her. So she goes over and she realizes that the door's unlocked and their purses are there and so forth and they've disappeared. Um, and unfortunately to this day, there's no word. Um, there's various theories. Um, we, um, we were careful about some of these subjects because th- th- this involves people. It's it's an ongoing case. Yes, it's never been closed. Um, the families are still in the area, and it's a sensitive subject. And so we're we're very respectful of that. Yeah, yeah, and <clears throat> I, I think a, 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 an aspect of dark ozarks and we've talked about this both in terms of of you know whether we're talking about sacred spaces whether we're talking about individuals um property uh whether we're talking about the you know the 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 ancestral memories uh, of individuals or whether we're talking about current events uh that it is crucial to approach these subjects with a high degree of sensitivity and a high degree of respect. And in, in some cases, in, re, in regards to simply respecting the family based on the comparatively small amount of time that has, has uh, elapsed. This is not like, you know, sharing, sharing stories from the 1850s. Right. Uh, this is a very, very different dynamic, and it requires uh, a level of sensitivity. I, I agree, and 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 information that's out there is out there, and at this point, we don't have anything to really add to that, and so our respect go out to the Street Dermot Call families. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and it's, you know, it is especially we're you know jumping over to issues of like you know ghost stories and and folk tales and stuff there is a 
a you know an exciting quality of the story is that sometimes it makes you shiver sometimes you learn things um something that from from you know my position as editor-in-chief of state of the ozarks you know my 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 you know day job your day job as a practicing attorney and as a you know as a very valued part of of your community in in uh, you know the carthage web city joplin area <sighs> something that I don't think is built into either one of us is, uh, you know, a, a desire to uh, be sensational or gratuitous or salacious in, uh, you know, in trying to capitalize off of someone's grief. Exactly. Exactly. So again, our, our, our sentiments are, mm -hmm. our uh, thoughts go out to the families. And I think, at this point, we leave it there um, yes. and leave it to law enforcement if they if they ever are able to solve the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. So speaking of eccentric characters that are far enough into the past to <laughs> uh, to uh, to not be disrespectful to the surviving family members. Oh my goodness! The 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 Joseph Nash, yes, Joseph Nash McDowell. Um, a interesting dive into the uh, eclectic and macabre. Yes, um, Doctor McDowell, I think pretty well encompasses everything that we look at in Dark Ozarks. Um, even, in one uh, person. One person, and um, actually, for, for people, I'm going to put this up here. This is a picture of Dr. McDowell, and he, he came from a family of doctors. He was extremely well respected and was considered one of the, the most brilliant surgeons of his time. Uh, and apparently, his uncle Ephraim McDowell was just as much or even more renowned as a doctor. So credibility on that part, you know, is without a doubt. Um, he uh, came from Kentucky, came to Missouri in 1839. Um, he had a longstanding interest in, well, several things, but death was one of them. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, different aspects as well. He was very interested in the idea of reanimation or preservation of, of a corpse until medical science perhaps could you know, proceed to the point of, of uh, reanimating a person. Um, he was... There's, there's just... I'm going to stop you right there. There is <laughs> something both intriguing and deeply disturbing about the phrase, I want to reanimate a corpse. Yeah, okay. Well, when, we've only when, started. <laughs> I know. When you, when you, and, and, and with the realization that this is not, this is not a, a 1950s B horror movie. This is a physician in the 1830s. Yes. And it gets even more interesting from there. Um, he had heard um, that they they found a partially mummified um, ancient American um, in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Yes. And he went to Mammoth Cave, and he a he actually graffitied one of the uh, the the uh, one of the rocks there, coffin rock. In fact, he signed it in 1839 i think i have a photo here somewhere but he went there because he was interested in trying to figure out why there was mummification and he concluded it was the limestone cave mm -hmm. so when he came to the st louis area it wasn't too long after that he bought a cave just south of hannibal missouri yes and it became known as McDowell's Cave. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are familiar with the cave, but they don't know it under that name. They know it as Mark Twain Cave. And it yeah. is the cave that is 
discussed and referenced in Tom Sawyer. Right, right. So to be commemorated by none other than Mark Twain well, uh, under, and, under a different name. Yes, and, and Mark Twain was actually very fascinated with Dr. McDowell. Um, I sent <laughs> for you good reason. Twain. Yeah, for good reason. Um, <laughs> and Mark Twain played in that cave when he was a boy. Yeah. And then um, in the early 1840s, um, Dr. McDowell's 14-year-old daughter died. And his interest in reanimation came to the forefront. And he, he uh, encapsulated her body in a copper coffin tube, basically, filled with alcohol, mm -hmm. and suspended it in the cave and blocked up the cave um, and hoping that her body would be preserved. Right. Well, as, as we know in this area, of course, Missouri is just thousand caves and we, we know what kids do with caves that are blocked off. They, they discovered another way in, they kind of vandalized it, that kind of thing. He ended up taking his daughter and putting her into the family vault in St. Louis. But, and that was sort of the end of that, it's, that experiment. But that very much was part of his experiment of trying to preserve the dead. So you have all that tangled up with, you know, caves and Mark Twain and everything else. He went on to uh, found the first yeah. medical school west, west of the Mississippi, Kemper uh, College. Yeah. And, but it was properly known as McDowell's Medical College. And then uh, ultimately, it, it, it's the foundation for the Washington University Medical School, which is a, a very highly regarded medical school. And it sat at 8th Street and Garrett, which is now the parking lot for Karina, I believe. And he built it, it was finished in 1849. It had uh, gun turrets. It, uh, he also was very fascinated with uh, military affairs. During the 1840s, he bought 1,400 muskets and three cannon. One, one was reputed to have belonged to the pirate, Jean Lafitte, who we've talked about before, who actually made it into the Ozarks. Um, and he mounted the cannon on the medical school. <laughs> and with some good reason, because uh, there tended to be mobs that showed up. Because, mm -hmm. as was not uncommon at the time, um, he was a resurrectionist. Right. Right. And would basically... Generally, how it was supposed to go is that uh, uh, paupers or convicted criminals who were executed that would be buried at public expense, their bodies would be available for medical research. Yeah. Often there wasn't enough of those cadavers, so medical students would, tended to buy or go dig up cadavers mm -hmm. and sell them to the medical school. Yes. Then in yeah. um, and rumors, rumors started spreading that that he that they were focusing on German immigrants, German and Irish immigrants, uh, which is kind of ironic because actually um, he was a Southerner when it came to the Civil War, uh, but he never owned slaves. But but his servants were all uh, German and Irish immigrants. And in 1849, a, a Miss Malter um, went missing. She was a German woman. And so the rumor quickly spread that, that she had been murdered. Uh, so now they were accusing Dr. McDowell of killing someone for use as a cadaver. And a and, uh, mob stormed the medical school. And they did not find Mrs. Malter. Actually, they found her 
later she had gone visiting a sister or something. <laughs> but in the course of, of this, um, while the mob is going through the medical school, uh, Dr. McDowell had ended up hiding on a gurner, uh, gurney, covered it with a sheet. And his story goes that the ghost of his mother appeared to him and instructed him where they were, where the mob was coming and yet helped him so that he would evade the mob. I love the, I love the, uh, the, the, the record that says that the, the light of his mother's ghost's halo led him to safety. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 th I think he idolized his mother, perhaps. But <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Uh, and you know maybe for good reason. I it's it is such a wow. I mean it, and and you know and just to to you know not to put too fine of a point on it, but in order for some of these individuals to be quote unquote resurrectionists, they were accused of or guilty of grave robbing. Yes. Yes. That and is deeply macabre. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, particularly when you're dealing with cadavers of people who had not either agreed to be donated to medical science or family had not that kind of thing. Um, yes. And then, of course, there were some, you know, that were more unsavory that would loot whatever might be in the grave, such as jewelry, et cetera. But right. I, I, that was never accused, just murder. <laughs> um, Only that. At least he had a cannon. Yes, yes. And he would fire. And actually, um, he ended up having been in a rivalry with the Catholic uh, Diocese and St. Louis University, which is a Catholic church, because he had been uh, the, uh, the attending doctor for um, the Catholic hospital in town. And the bishop... Uh, when they established the St. Louis University Medical School in competition with his, um, they relieved him of duties and appointed a Catholic doctor. So he periodically would shoot the cannon at the other law school, which actually was across the street. They built it across the street from his medical school. <laughs> um, let's see what, let's see. <clears throat> see what history teaches us in terms of our our noble forebears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's all about perspective. Oh my goodness. Or at least it's centricity. Yeah, um, <laughs> very much so. I love the fact that that uh, in in this the he got his medical training in the the notes that we were reviewing. Uh, he got his medical training in Kentucky from a school that was titled Transylvania. Yeah, University of Transylvania. Actually, it's a respected university, private university, but but mm -hmm. yes, I've always wondered why they chose that name. I have to admit. <laughs> and and you you think about you know I'd, I'd like to dig into the history of that because you know you you look at the founding. It was going to be probably at least you know close to a century before Bram Stoker ever wrote uh, his novel. And that was really the first official into public consciousness that we start associating Transylvania with creepy stuff, which of course is, you know, kind of a kind of a pastiche in and of itself. So, you know, dramatically earlier, uh, just the, the coincidence of, of having this very eccentric, uh, potentially grave robbing, re corpse, corpse reanimating doctor getting his training from University of Transylvania in Kentucky. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. It is. And, and, and he has another connection with um, spiritualism of the 1800s and early ghost hunting. He actually became an early ghost hunter. Wow. Um, because he was so interested. And he was, he was pretty open about the fact that he spoke with spirits. Um, mm -hmm. and there's one correspondence with a cousin, I believe, who asked him about it and, 
and he said um, basically that there, you know, there's a lot to be learned, and we, you know, that we should explore those unknown subjects. Um, mm -hmm. And to kind of give everyone an idea, if this doesn't paint a century picture already, uh, his students had a love hate relationship with him. They, he was, I guess, phenomenal as a as an instructor and lecturer, but he was full of contradictions, and they they would note that. And and we we talked earlier. I think uh, maybe the the one quote uh, it was from a student that might sum it up for people was he said that uh, Dr. McDowell could lecture for hours on the harm of alcohol to the human body while he was drinking gin out of a hip flask. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how, that's how it works. And I, I, you know, and maybe not in terms of, of eccentricity, but um, unique locations. I, I saw a post not on Dark Ozarks, but it was a Facebook post, um, Ozarks related on, on social media, but it was a uh, location in St. Louis. And somebody weighed in and said, St. Louis is not in the Ozarks. And we've talked a lot about these border spaces. Right. And something that I really had to do a lot of research on when I started State of the Ozarks if I was going to do it right, was to figure out where the Ozarks were and were not. And realizing that the, the, there's a geologic, a ge geographical boundaries of the Ozarks. And then there are cultural boundaries of the Ozarks. And in some cases, you might no longer be in the Ozarks. For example, you might be in the Washita Mountains down in, in Arkansas. You are not in the Ozarks, but you are absolutely in Ozark culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, 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 the reverse is yeah no oh, go ahead oh uh, go ahead oh, i was gonna say and, and i think that you know i think the definition i've seen before is that geo geographically geologically those are are six miles away from downtown st louis or something like that yes yes and and that is something i find really really fascinating about the st louis area because there is a portion, there's a, there's a decent chunk of the, of the St. Louis Metroplex that is geographically within the Ozarks. And, yeah. uh, you know, for, for tourist folks or anybody who's been uh, to uh, Six Flags St. Louis, uh, Six Flags is absolutely within, you know, topographically, geologically within the Ozarks. Uh, culturally, probably not. Uh, but geographically, yes. And so something that is interesting, of course, we don't want to abuse this and, you know, suddenly make Dark Ozarks all, you know, the St. Louis channel. But when there are interesting stories that reach into the, the, the history of St. Louis or the history of St. Charles, both of these cities were historical and cultural gateways into the Ozarks. And they are literally perched on the, the immediate periphery. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of story there, for example, I mean, especially with, uh, with his doctor. Well, yeah, and, and there's even more uh, as, as it goes on. But an interesting thing is we have a direct connection with Dr. McDowell to Lilydale, New York, which, of course, is the center of spiritualism. Spir yes. <laughs> The, uh, when the Fox sisters from Lilydale, who were the first big sensation in the spiritualism movement, came to St. Louis, um, actually, Dr. McDowell was brought in to help determine if they were faking their mediumship. And so what did he find? Well, as, as the accounts say that he interrogated them and examined them and listened to their performances until he was weary and concluded that this was not uh, anything uh, medically related or even a, a hoax that he could determine that it definitely was a spiritual question. Mm -hmm. You know, he basically Very. concluded that it, it that it 
spirit talk was going on. But of course, this is also from someone who who um, admitted that he he spoke with spirits himself. I don't know whether he would characterize himself as a medium, but mm -hmm. so uh, he did not discount them. Um, but on the other hand, he did not seem to be all in either, you know, um, but gave the, uh, at least gave leeway that they, that something may be going on. I just, I just want to know if he shot off his cannons from the turrets while they were there. I don't know. He did keep a pet bear in the, in the medical school as well. I'm... I forgot to mention that. At this point, at this point, I am really not sure whether I'm dismayed by this individual or he's my hero. I know exactly, exactly. Um, but yes, he he kept the uh, the pet bear in the medical school, and and mobs did did march on the medical school several times. You know when they felt that grave robbing was going on, but. And I guess he yeah. did release the 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 bear on the mob once they had made it into <laughs> medical school. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, yes, yeah, so no, it's hard. You know, you you, the, you know the, this is definitely you know you, you don't get much darker in in a lot of ways. And no, then, or more entertaining. <laughs> exactly, and here's a real and here's a, another real tie with the Ozarks. When when the um, when the war broke out, when the Civil War broke out, um, Doctor Medell, who had Southern leanings, he was from the South. Yes. He went off and joined the Confederate Army as a surgeon, mm -hmm. and the Union Army, who had the arsenal in St. Louis, saw fit to take over his medical school and turned it into the Garrett Street Prison. Yes. Which that and what later became the uh, penitentiary in St. Louis, it was a fort at the time in, in uh, I mean, in Jeff City, um, were the two main prisons during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And at Garrett Street, um, you had a lot of guerrilla fighters, bushwhackers, spies that tended to come from southern Missouri and they were prisoners there. Right. Uh, interestingly, they they tend they 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 were housed mainly in um, the classrooms and so forth and apparently would refer to each other as students. And if they if they were released from prison, the joke was they graduated from medical school. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So very, very good. Mm -hmm. so, and, and they and then they also executed prisoners there as well. So uh, a lot of those prisoners came from those starts. Um, yeah. After wow. after the war, uh, doctor came back and resumed the medical school until his death. And then later, uh, it was torn down, and the, the site of the uh, medical school is actually on the parking lot of Purina, Ralston. Wow. So do we know where he is buried? He is buried um, in St. Louis. The, there's a family plot. And he actually, I don't know if I printed a copy, uh, picture of the tombstone. Uh, actually, a pretty simple grave. It was yeah. not ornate or ostentatious. Mm. That uh, so he didn't he didn't leave in his will to like be pickled and brined and reanimated later. Apparently not. Apparently not. He he was he was buried. Um, now I don't. I have no idea whether, or at least it's not been said, if there's any unusual things about his coffin, but uh, <laughs> nothing that we know of. <laughs> Oh my gracious! That is that's that is that's crazy. It's fun. Um, it's it's uh, it it adds. You know, you you think about. I think this is what I this is what I particularly love about adding these sorts of con contextual elements to history, uh, the history immediately around us in our region. You know, you can grow up your whole life in these these areas. 
and and have no idea that that the you know these characters or this bit of history or these moments might have taken place in your front yard like the Ritchie mansion or you know just down the street or just down the corner or just over the hill but when you learn about them it, it to me it's you know not only does it add context but it adds flavor and a sense of pride of one's you know region yes i mean you know i, I think you have to look at uh dr mcdowell that you know uh, professionally he, he he did some amazing things he was very eccentric um but you know sometimes genius and it's a eccentricity are the flip side of the coin so it is it is do you do you want to talk about norman baker a little bit yeah i think that'd be we got a little bit of time we can okay. we can finish, finish up with that i i think um i think our good doctor from st louis was probably more um uh mm, what's the word <laughs> um more engaging as a human being um i i think the 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 the, the final tally on on dr baker is that he was a scam artist at least that's the sort of history's current consensus yes would be the, the reality uh and he, he utilized uh, mass media in the 1920s and 30s, uh, specifically radio, to, uh, to sell stuff, um, to sell ideas and, to, and specifically to sell product. And so, you know, he tended to land on his product being uh, cancer cures, which, you know, is, is always a, a questionable place to land on uh, on anything especially when you're you're preying on on individuals who are who are desperate and and ultimately he purchased the crescent hotel and it for several years into a uh, uh, technically a sanitarium sanatorium but a, essentially a hospital uh, putting hospital in quotes where and and he had a he had a large newsletter list. Um, he advertised <laughs> quite heavily uh, to thousands and thousands and got a lot of people who were desperately ill booking what would become one-way tickets to Eureka Springs to, yeah. uh, to pay him a lot of money to be at his hotel uh, or his hospital. And uh, the, the marketing brochures at the time said that it was a, essentially a luxury spa where you could come with your, your health concerns and be healed. And, you know, before you knew it, you were playing racquetball in the front yard and, you know, gambling about the lawn with the, you know, the other, other uh, guests. And uh, the reality was was deeply macabre, but not uh, unexpected. Obviously, he did not apparently have any cure for his, uh, for, you know, for in these ailments. Uh, but the, the treatments that he imposed were apparently quite painful. And then even not even, you know, the, the quote unquote cure, the quackery cure, notwithstanding, you had individuals with, you know, essentially lating in their health rapidly, which of course in many cases is horribly painful, just as a, as a matter of course. And so, you know, the for individuals who are familiar with the, the crescent, you have the large uh, sort of white limestone, coarse limestone section, and then what was originally back in the Edwardian era, uh, Victorian era, was uh, the, the servants' quarters. And, uh, and Dr. Baker installed uh, heavy doors on uh, the, the entryways over into the servants' quarters, and he put the most desperately ill and about to, to die patients in that section, literally so that it would be more difficult for people in the rest of the hotel to hear them screaming 
and you know that that gives you a a sense of what this person was actually like and all the while he was he was making an enormous amount of money doing this all the way up until nearly the beginning of, of the second world war so he you know baker was was interesting at at, at best um chillingly notorious at worst um his favorite color was purple uh, he kept a machine gun under his octagonal desk and uh, was was quite convinced that somebody was out to kill him, which they may may very well have been. May may have been considering. <laughs> yes, and uh, he he is responsible for some interesting renovations of the uh, of the crescent, and uh, his desk is still in the hotel in the front lobby, and his office, which was originally had bulletproof glass in the office uh if you go into the into the hotel and immediately to your right will be the the giant fireplace with the bat owls engraved on it from the irish stonemasons and then just past that is the gift shop well the gift shop was his office and uh it is rumored uh that his uh, his spirit still haunts the place i don't know uh, that one way or the other. I think that's whether it is true or whether it isn't, it's easy to say just because he was such a, an eccentric and notorious character. And then the, the last uh, bit of that history breaching into our present day is that last year, uh, a cache of his uh, cure, uh, his, you know, bottled bottles of his, his, special elixir when earthed on the host play and the the area that they were buried in is, is also available for the public to view without actually traipsing into the area and, and that actually made um international news i know it was on bbc mm -hmm. yep. actually actually part part of the discovery was why all ghost adventures was there i believe okay it's uh it's a lot of you know the the crescent hotel is just a I, I think, first of all, it is beautiful. It yes. is a beautiful hotel. Uh, very old, built in 1886. And it's, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a neat place, but it does have a, an admittedly dark past. Well, and I, you know, I, I think if you, if you, if you compare Baker and McDowell, I think both obviously eccentric, but turned in very different ways. McDowell, definitely was a doctor a healer first and foremost mm -hmm. um yes. and his sort of um panache for the for the macabre was his interest in death and reanimation um not harming anyone where baker was just the opposite taking advantage of of people and really inflicting pain and misery and i would i would tend to agree especially doing so for profit right right and, uh, and i think that is is the is the most chilling aspect of of baker's story with is something that i mean obviously you know here we are today in 2020 and we know that you know you you can't stick somebody in a you know on a, a cork him up in a wine bottle and then you know pull them out and you know, bring them back to life afterwards. Right. But at, at the same time, I not maybe not to give McDowell too much of a free pass. However, you know, he we he was. I, I think first of all, uh, had to have been an extraordinarily intelligent person. Um, yeah. and, and, and sometimes, and and sometimes extraordinarily high intelligence pushes individuals into eccentricity. And if you also look at the advances, especially, you know, we'll just take the Industrial Revolution uh, as a beginning, but the advances that McDowell would have witnessed over the course of his life. And the, you know, I, I think to someone with his, you know, sort of turn of thought, it might not be impossible for him to have looked at those advances in technology that had been, you know, previously impossible and said, well, if that is impossible, but it's just happened, then what if? 
what if and that it might be possible and maybe maybe in 30 years something can happen um mm -hmm. and of course uh his experiment in in the cave with with the with the casket was born out of he had mm -hmm. he had that interest already but it was born out of grief of losing losing a child too so yes yes out and, of desperation and i think especially yeah to you know to to put yourself in his place and 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 to you know experience that level of grief that is uh it, it really you know mcdowell and baker i think are really point counterpoint the antithesis of one another yes and where mcdowell and his ghost stories are about his exploring and talking with spirits and seeing spirits um baker perhaps created ghost stories to remain at the crescent yes yeah yeah and that's one one uh continuing story with the crescent is uh late at night hearing you know the 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 wheels of gurneys uh rattling down the hall or or perhaps mm -hmm. uh seeing a, a ghost nurse with a with a uh, you know, an individual on the gurney going down the, the guest halls. Yes. And so, yeah, I agree. Uh, definitely a point counterpoint. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. And in that regard, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take Dr. McDowell. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And his pet bear. And, and his, his, his pet bear. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we need t-shirts. I think we do. <laughs> I think this would be good. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but t-shirts, t-shirts would be good. So, uh, of course, we'll be back on Monday night, uh, right here on uh, on Facebook Live at Dark Ozarks. And then, of course, we're, we're prepping for uh, the event at the Coleman Theater in Miami in late June, uh, last yes. Saturday in June, is that right? Uh, yes. And uh, so about a month from now, and uh, we hope you guys can be there. We'd love to see you all, and and uh, if you, again, if you guys have things you want us to talk about, let us know. We'll do our best. Absolutely, we we will, we will, and uh, what we don't know, we'll look up. That's right. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. I uh, hope everybody has a a safe and a positive weekend. A yeah. good weekend. Uh, looks like we're gonna have some 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 finally some really decent nice warm weather here in the ozarks we're happy about that and, me too uh, me too <laughs> uh, i think it's one one step at a time so uh y'all be safe and uh lisa as always this is this is a blast so appreciate yes, it yes it is you guys <laughs> take care and i'll talk i'll talk to you later josh all right y'all take care see ya bye <laughs>